you think this weather took her? This gonna work. Welcome to nowhere. Well, as you can see, the sky cleared up very nicely for me. My dog Tucker and I are gonna spend the night in Pike and San Isabel National Forest. We're gonna camp out under the stars. The goal is to spend the night recording the wonders of the night. Tucker, no. The goal is to spend the entire night recording the wonders of the night sky. What I'd like to do is start you off with a classic sunset, which technically is astrophotography if you think about it. We're gonna take a look at Venus, which has been hanging out in the western sky after dusk. We're gonna take a look at three different comets that are visible in the night sky right now that you can photograph with a camera and lens combination like the one I'm about to show you or through a telescope. But the purpose of this video is to show you that you can create amazing astrophotos using minimal astrophotography gear. The first thing is to find a nice dark sky location. And what better place than a national forest? This is Pike and San Isabel National Forest, and that's Pike's Peak. There are a couple of advantages of national forests. For one, they're far away from cities. But this one in particular isn't terribly far from Denver or Colorado Springs, but far enough away from those two cities that there's not very much light pollution here. But there's an even bigger advantage. I'm at a higher elevation than those two cities. The higher you are in elevation, the less light pollution will scatter. Light pollution bounces around the most in that very lowest layer of the atmosphere. It's no big wonder then why observatories are built on the tops of mountains. The first thing that gets you is less light pollution, but what that also gets you is the fact that at the tops of mountains, the air is drier and therefore the sky is bluer. The reason for that is that there's just less moisture in the air to create haze or clouds. So the first step is finding a really great dark sky site. The darker, the better. You can use light pollution maps to find the best sites. That's how I found this one. Well, I'll have to see if we actually do get a sunset out of this, but here we go. Really important tool of every astrophotographer is an intervalometer. Need a way to take exposures, take long exposure photographs or consecutive photographs without touching the camera. It's key. Touch the camera, you shake the image. You shake the image, you shake your stars. It's gonna be super important that you have a really beefy tripod. Any large tripod should do. It doesn't have to be a Manfrotto, but this happens to be a beefy Manfrotto. The reason you're gonna want a beefy tripod is to support one of these guys. This is a tracking mount. This is the iOptron Skyguider Pro, for example. I happen to recommend this particular one simply because it's the one I use, but there are others, there's competing ones that are really just as good. As I mentioned before, you need an intervalometer. These are absolutely critical. If you wanna do astrophotography, get one of these. I absolutely cannot stress enough you need one of these. Whether you do tripod astrophotography or tracking mount, you need an intervalometer. You're gonna want a DSLR camera. And this one happens to be a T3i, which today you could get one for about $250, maybe less. And this particular one I happen to modify. And if you look up in the corner of the screen here, I'll post the link to the video where I did that. Okay, so now there's two possible routes you can go next. You can either get the telescope or just get a lens. And I say get the lens first. Don't worry about the telescope yet. Get the lens next. A really great example of a fantastic and inexpensive astrophotography lens is this 135 millimeter Rokinon. This guy, I think it was about $500, but I'll post the price on the video here. This is a prime lens, which means it doesn't expand in and out. It's just stuck at 135 millimeter. But more importantly, it happens to be a fast lens. This one's an F2, for example. That's an extremely fast piece of glass, which means you can gather more light in less time, which is super awesome. If you do go the telescope route, don't get a big one. Don't get one of those uh, fancy computerized ones. You, you can do that later, or you can do that if you want to give your kid a toy. I'm serious. Get a telescope like this one. It doesn't have to be a William Optics, but it needs to be a small refractor telescope. That really should be where you go next. When it comes to astrophotography, in most cases, you want low magnification and you want a lot of light to be collected. You don't necessarily need to get a big, powerful telescope with lots of power. You just need to get a small telescope that can collect a lot of light, which means generally you're going to save money because you don't need to have a big, heavy telescope on a big, beefy mount. This is tiny. This is a tiny mount <laughs> and it can barely support this guy. So you, you really want a, a bigger mount than this one, but this one kind of, it kind of handles it, and I'll show you that in a little bit here. So to review, a beefy tripod, a tracking mount, a really good fast lens, and I recommend this one or one similar to it, and a DSLR camera with an intervalometer. That setup, all by itself, will get you some really amazing astrophotography. And I'll show you some examples here shortly. To adapt 
a telescope to a camera, you're gonna need an adapter like this one. So one of these, either a reducer or just a, a straight uh, barrel, a two inch barrel like that looks like this that attaches it to your camera. And they typically come in two parts. One to attach it to your particular brand of camera and then something to attach to the actual telescope and then they thread together. And you don't need the eyepiece for astrophotography, but I brought that for a very specific purpose, which I'll show you in just a second. Tucker, you're all tangled up. <laughs> what is this mess? Yep, you probably want me to fix you. You're crazy. You're crazy. Whoop! Ah, oh, you're still a puppy. Seven years of this, folks. Seven years. <laughs> All right, so this is what the dual configuration looks like. I have a ball tripod head here with the 135 millimeter on my modified camera. And over here is the telescope. This weight needs to balance out, and it kind of doesn't right now, but that's okay. It will once I attach this camera. And you need weight on either side, so you might as well have another camera on the weight side of the telescope, on the weight side of the mount, and that way you can get a two for one. You don't have to have two cameras or a telescope and a lens. You can do just one camera with this mount, and that's totally fine. But if you got two, you might as well do two. A lot of people have been asking me what this bright thing is up here. So I'm going to show you. Like I said, I got an eyepiece on there. And then it's a telescope. Pointed right at Venus. And here's how it looks. What do you think, Tucker? <laughs> Neighbor's dog showed up. Pretty dog. So let's try this again now. It's a little bit darker. There's that bright star that people are talking about in the West, but it's not a star. It's a planet. And if I put you through the eyepiece, line you up just perfectly you can see it and Venus right now is a crescent now Venus is a crescent because it's an inferior planet you can see that it's very close to where the Sun recently set it's between the earth and the Sun in an inferior orbit that roughly lines up like this but it never gets further than about about over here or so and it, it, for a while in the evening for a couple of months in the evening it will start out as a gibbous planet it looks like a gibbous moon uh, it's a fat moon um, and comes around the back side of the sun orbits around and back forward between the earth and the sun and then it pops out the other side and turns around and rises in the opposite sky. So it pops out the other side, crosses right directly in between uh, the Earth and the Sun, and then it becomes a morning star instead of an evening star like it is right now. So for several months uh, soon, you'll see it in the morning instead of the evening. So that's why sometimes you don't notice it at all 
for months and months because it becomes a morning star and people forget about it. And then approximately a year later, it pops out as an evening star again, just like this. And you can see it again. So that's Venus. On to some deep sky astrophotography. To start things off, we have what's left of comet C2019 Y4 Atlas, taken with my 135mm lens. This comet, had it held together, would have already become naked eye visible at this point. Instead, we have a diffuse nucleus and an elongated coma of only about magnitude 9.5. Far from naked eye visible at this point, even getting difficult to photograph with the gear I have. A month ago, by comparison, we had a bright, compact nucleus of magnitude 7. Much, much brighter. So what's next for Atlas Y4? Unfortunately, probably not anything interesting. This comet is extremely far away, crumbling, and may even completely dissolve before its closest approach to the sun. That, of course, hasn't stopped the misinformation all over YouTube. So I'll say it again. Crumbling comet won't survive too far away. My favorite one in the last week is that someone is saying that the leftovers of the comet will impact Earth sometime between July and September of this year. Funny they should say that, since that's exactly the span of time of the Perseid meteor shower, the most impressive one of the year, which is centered on August 11th and 12th, and lasts a few weeks on either side of that. Check out my Perseid meteor kayak camping video taken from August of 2018. Go easy on me though, that's an older video, but you may enjoy it all the same. Using my 81GT William Optics Telescope, we can get a much closer look. With some effort, I got a nice beauty shot of C2019Y4 Atlas. Telescopic images of comets make them look so much more impressive even as this one is giving up the ghost. And Atlas Y4 isn't even the only comet visible to telescopes and camera lenses right now. It's not even the only Atlas. Here's Atlas Y1, discovered only days before Y4. This comet hasn't been hyped because this is the brightest and closest it's going to get right now. Ironically, Atlas Y1 is brighter, with a longer tail, and more impressive to look at than Y4. Another comet also visible to telescopes and camera lenses is PanStars, again with the same combination of camera and lens. And yet again, another comet slightly more impressive at the moment than Atlas Y4. I guess if there's a point to be made here, comets like this are common, and kind of illustrates the pointlessness of the hysteria C2019 Y4 Atlas was causing. Knowing what comet might actually become impressive enough to enjoy from your back porch is tricky business, but not a reason to flood YouTube with tinfoil hat conspiracies and doomsday talk. So let's look at all three, taken with the same gear, same settings, and same processing techniques. Effectively, this is an apples to apples comparison of how each looks from Earth. Tell me which one is your favorite in the comments. Now, why didn't I photograph brand new comet C2020 F8 Swan? Well, I live in the Northern Hemisphere, and currently only Southern Hemisphere observers can see Comet Swan. The three comets I photographed before are above the solar system, while Swan is approaching the Sun from below the solar system. Like Atlas Y4 did last month, C2020 F8 Swan suddenly surged in brightness and is now just barely naked eye visible. However, Atlas never got this far, and just look how stunning this comet is to photograph right now. It doesn't look anything like this to the naked eye yet, but that could change in the next couple of weeks. If you live in the southern hemisphere, look due east just before morning twilight in the coming days. If the comet behaves, you only need to look east from a very dark sky to see Swan. If this comet continues to overperform, that would be wonderful for northern hemisphere viewers in late May. In the days just after about May 20th, if Swan behaves, it should allow views in the west just after sunset for a brief couple of weeks. I'm going to keep an eye on its progress and make a follow-up video once I'm able to photograph Swan for myself. Now for something different. Here's the Ursa Major Galaxy Cluster taken with the same tracking mount, modified Canon T3i, and 135mm lens. I like this lens because, as with the comets you saw earlier, you get a sense of a spacewalk across a generous amount of sky, and you can see the relative size of other objects as viewed from Earth. In the center is M106, but there are more than a dozen other galaxies in this image. I'm going to make a dedicated video about Ursa Major in the future, and I needed this image for that next video. Meanwhile, a great reason to go camping and do some astrophotography is that you can get some sleep in between imaging sessions. Can I talk about? So let's set up for the next one. A camera with a wide-angle lens on a fixed tripod can still provide excellent results. With the Milky Way core, for example, which right now, in April, doesn't rise until well after 1 a.m. Unfortunately, some clouds started to filter in, which can still make for a pretty time-lapse. 
but it wasn't kind to my other deep sky astrophoto that I was putting together. Right here, just above the Milky Way core, is the Rho Ophiuchi region, which if you ask me, is my absolute favorite spot in the night sky. I was only afforded about 45 minutes worth of good sub-exposures on my modified T3i 135mm lens combo. This was yet another target I needed for a future video. But a quick tour of what's going on here. These are dark lanes of gas and dust that may become parts of future stars. The bright orange star is Antares, part of the constellation Scorpio. Over here is the M4 star cluster. And the several blue stars surrounded by a blue reflection nebula is Rho Ophiuchi. The red hydrogen alpha halo here surrounds Sigma Scorpii. At any rate, this area of the sky represents so many cool things all in one photo, and lots of detail on all of these things are coming in a future Scorpio video. My Constellation series videos are some of the most complex and time-consuming ones I make as it requires a trip like this with lots of camera time and processing time, and I need to do it several times. Check out the two in the series I've already done if that might be of some interest to you. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed and learned something new. Leave a comment, ask a question, tell me how I'm doing. And when this pandemic blows over, I hope you'll get way outside and learn something new.